Hi, this is uh, Jay Horowitz with uh, Bill Pulsifer, uh, Generation K, a long time ago. You know what, Bill, looking back, I've been with the Mets a long time, and some of the things that maybe overdid, overkill my years, promoting Daryl Strawberry, the black Ted Williams, uh, cover Sports Illustrated. Looking back on your time with the Mets, you know, second round draft pick, uh, minor league pitcher of the year one year. How much effect did that have on you, know, you, Izzy, Paul Wilson, Jay Payton, a little bit? It, was that added pressure on you in the beginning? Um, I've always said this. I've always said, like, I felt the only pressure that was put on me was the pressure that I put on myself. Right. And I, because I just wanted to succeed so much. And it was kind of like I was young and naive and I expected to be in the position that I was in. And that was the kinds of the goals that I was reaching for uh, and things just kind of kept falling into place for me. So I didn't ever feel the pressure that was supposedly put on by the organization or by the media or anything like that. I just had such high hopes for myself and high expectations. I kind of looking back felt guilty a little bit. I mean, at that time we came up in the midnight, we weren't a good team. Right. We were a bad team. I think one year, we lost 103 games. I don't know if you were, I think we were with us that year. Well, I believe it might have been in 96, but yeah. I had ended up hurting my elbow at the end of 95. Right. And I traveled with the club that whole year yeah, right. and uh, didn't actually get to play. And um, unfortunately, the Yankees started winning a bunch of World Series. Too, yes, so they, that kind of did. added the pressure on uh, the Mets to try to, you know, improve the organization, improve the big league ball club. But I mean, we, we put pressure on the younger guys like with Darryl. When he came up in 83, you know, uh, yeah. we were a bad team then too, but he, Hit the uh, you know rookie of the year twenty six home runs. I always felt that you know I said yes to every interview. I know we had the slogans promoting Generation K on the right. subways, the bus stops, and right. I mean, looking back, I said you know there's got to be one thing I've learned as a PR guy. Sometimes no is better than yes. Sometimes you know and you take it gradually. But you said you never really felt. The well, I was such a a blowhard and such a loudmouth that right. I was kind of wanted to do everything anyway. Uh, probably a mistake, obviously, and like I said, naive. But, um, you know, I had waited my whole life to, and it wasn't that much, I was only 21 years old, right. but this was my dream since I was four years old, and then to be able to, to put on a Mets uniform and do it as a Met and, and to walk into Shea Stadium. You know, I grew up a Mets fan. It was very easy to be a Mets fan in the, the mid to late 80s, and my two childhood heroes were, were on those ball clubs with Doc and Straw. So to me, it just felt like the thing things were going in the direction that I had always seen things to go for me. And um, sure, maybe it would have been nice if somebody, but I don't know if I would have even listened, you know, if somebody would told me, right. you know, don't do this or don't go do that interview. You don't need to speak to the media. You don't need to. I was uh, so wrapped up in being Bill Pulsifer at the time that I, I probably I might not have listened anyway. And he had Tommy John surgery. Yeah, too. unfortunately, you know, I threw a lot of innings as a young player and um, I did some things that will probably never happen again, like throwing 131 pitches my first start in the major right. leagues. I'm sure that will never happen again. Or throwing 200 innings in a minor league season, that's not gonna ever happen again. But um, I didn't know any better. I wanted the ball, I was a competitor, I wanted to be out there, and I just felt like even though I was a rookie, that this was the path that my life was gonna take and I was gonna walk into that situation and just gonna roll with it and run with it and you know go as far as it would take me. It's kind of remarkable that three guys, you know, uh, Paul got hurt, never really got, got to, to be, me and, and Izzy really got his fame as a, as a closer right. with with Oakland. Came back on right. the and save and and um, and Jay, you know, had productive years with us. Right. You keep in contact. With those I guys? speak with uh, Izzy quite often. You know, we're still in contact. I don't speak with Paul or, or I, I did see Jay at the old timers day when I saw him on television. That's yeah. the first time I'd seen him in quite a while. But uh, we're obviously a lot older now. But. Um, I speak with Izzy, you know, we, we stay in contact, we he, saw each he, other. Well, he's with the Cardinals, right? He's, yes, he's, yes, and we were trying to get him down to camp here, but unfortunately it's in November now, and he's a, you know, he's a deer hunter, so it's tough to get him out of the trees. You wrote an article, I forget, and I read it the other day, about telling me about your bouts with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. what, what year was it, 2005 or 06? That was 05. And who did you write that for again? It was with Baseball America. I was uh, with the assistance of uh, Alan Schwartz, who was one of the writers there, right. a great, great baseball writer. And uh, me and him had been in contact for years. And then when I made it back to the big leagues in 05, he was like, hey, I'd really like to like for you to do a story about your story. And, um, you know, I felt like it would help help some players out. And I think that, to be honest with you, I might have been like the beginning of a- That's what I was gonna say. You, people are doing it now, the, the more and more they're not afraid to come out and that's the right way to talk about the troubles. You, feel proud you were the first guy? I, I do. I, I really, I, I know that I didn't have the, the greatest major league career. I, I am a major leaguer. You can never take that away from me. Right. And I'm very, very proud of that. 
but I do feel like I have my mark on the game where I kind of did make the game kind of change a little bit in a way, and that was one of the things. Uh, being more open about what's going on when you're standing out on that field and you don't feel right, because that's it's always the place where you feel the most comfortable in your life is being out on the baseball field. And, and when it becomes the most uncomfortable place for you, it's it's scary and it's it's lonesome out there. But um, I definitely feel like things have changed and I was a, a, part, a catalyst to that. And then I also think then again, with the innings pitched and the amount of pitches and stuff like that, I think that I had a a big mark on on changing the way that they approach uh, with pitchers nowadays as well. You, you, how long did it take you to do that? I mean, did you, was it hard to? I'm gonna. It was my whole career, and it was one of those things that I got on to some anti-anxiety, anti-depression medications, and then I would start flourishing, and then I would be the stubborn baseball player that I was, and start to not be regular with my meds, and then it would be two, three weeks later, and all of a sudden I'm struggling again. You you, you keyed on a game in Syracuse, yeah, and then when you when you you felt that was that the low point and was it oh, man it's it's tough to pick a low point there was there's so many of them where you felt like uh you know i i actually retired and unretired two or three times before right i was like oh, you know what i'm gonna go back and play but uh i just remember syracuse being because i was in spring training that year was it 2000 no. that was uh spring that that year was 1997 and i was coming back from tommy john and I was working out here six days a week over in the minor league clubhouse with Dak and had a great spring training, but my velocity wasn't quite what it was right. prior to the surgery. And then I read in the newspaper that uh, Isringhausen and Wilson and, and Pulsifer are going to start the year on a rehab assignment in Norfolk. And I went to Dak. I'm like, Dak, man, we've been working out together all winter. I've, this is the first I've heard of this. I felt like I lost my job due to injury. And I grew up in the, in the era of you don't lose your job to injury. Right. I had a starting position in the, in the rotation. I felt like if I showed that I can go out there and pitch that I, I had my job back. And something just, something just snapped, you know? And I think back as a youngster, I remember the free throw line in high school where, that's, where I remember feeling that same feeling of, I'm, ugh, you know, I've got butterflies. It's stuff that, you know, didn't feel all that often. And then all of a sudden it became just overwhelming for me where I had no control of it. And, you know, and then obviously the Mets had Dr. Lands and I started speaking with him and I would stick to it for a while and then I would, Blacks off on it. It was just a roller coaster. It's, he was a good friend, Dr. Yeah, he's a great he, man. He, 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 when my mother died, I had to call him when she got had a stroke, and I didn't know what to take over the ventilator. I called him, and he told me what to he do. He was a great man. Yeah, he was and, a great man. Is yeah. he still alive? I, mean, he, I just spoke to him the other day. He's 91. Oh, my goodness. He still goes to work every day. You know, he well, please, work with please tell him that I say I, that. I, I, I will. Thank I, you, please. But he's you, a great man. Do you... Speak to younger guys. I mean, have you told? I them? wish I'd like to. I really wish. I mean, look, man, I blew. I blew my chance a few years ago to get back into it, and um, maybe it's passed me by. I don't know, but uh, you know, I have a feeling for for the younger player, and it's not easy being a young guy going up in New York. You think it's the greatest thing in the world, and it is. It really is. But I was talking about it with some of the fantasy camp guys. I look at guys like Doc, and I look at guys like Mike Tyson, that were teenagers, and they're on top of the world in New York City. If you don't have the right guidance or the right head on your shoulders, you really don't have a chance. If you don't want to either listen or, ha or don't even have people to try to help you out, you're, gonna, you know, you're a kid, you don't know any better. You think you know everything, but you don't know anything. So sure, I'd love to be, I, you know, but I'm just not, in, I'm not involved at this time. And um, I keep hopes I mean, I mean, is this just a team about how about, you know, speaking to high schools or, you know, going to, you live in- Well, I'd give pitching lessons. Yeah. And so for me, it's obviously mechanical because that's another thing that I felt like when I was coming up, as soon as I hurt my arm, they tell me, oh, well, you hurt your arm because of the way you throw. Well, wait a minute, I signed at 17. We didn't change the way I threw right. because I was really good at getting people out. So I feel like as a, young, as a, as a pitching instructor, I really, really want to focus on the mechanics of throwing the ball correctly. But also, you can have terrible mechanics and be able to pitch, right. but if your mind doesn't allow you to be able to calm yourself down and to execute the pitches and being free and easy, then so that's a big part of my teaching as well as the mental side of the game and teaching yourself how to try to calm down and relax. And obviously I'm not a doctor, but if I see something in a young, a young player, um, I have a talk with their, their parents and ask them, do you feel like your son maybe has anxiety? How about when he takes a test in school? Does he get anxious about the test? And if you want your son to be a baseball player, then you might have to take some steps outside of just lessons or being on the field to help you be able to deal with these types of things because baseball is a very difficult sport and it's obviously it's a game that's played in the mind that comes out of the body so 
I try to. I definitely try to assist as many kids as I can that I give lessons to. So the fantasy campers know who you are. I mean, a lot of them. A lot of them do. Yes, and uh, you know what? I've always said this about Mets fans: is uh, I like I said, things didn't turn out exactly the way we all wanted them, but I feel like uh, the majority of Mets fans, if not all Mets fans that I ever come across, I'm treated very well, uh, and I appreciate that. And um, excuse me. <clears throat> well, I take it. It's nice to come back. Certainly, you know, and, and that's, Bill, that's what I would do in my in position with the alumni. We're doing this podcast to reach out to guys who people haven't heard from in a while. You know, to, to, I mean, you're still, you didn't want to say, but your story to me is probably better than a, anybody's won 20 games and won three side units because you reach people, you have a message to people, so you should really be proud of what you did. It's really a long way before people started doing this regularly. Now you pick up the paper every other day. There's another a gymnast, I forgot, you know, yeah. tennis players. Yep. They come out and they say, yep. you know. Uh, Unfortunately, I was ahead of my time a little bit, you know. <laughs> but, I was ahead of my time with, you know, being a little bit of a free spirit. That's a little bit more allowed than it was in my time. And then obviously with the, the mental side of, the, of all of the sports and all that, it's, it's a little bit more accepted. And I consider myself an old school player, an old school guy, but I feel like maybe it wasn't quite accepted as it is nowadays, but you could still be an old school, hard nosed guy and, and still say, you know what, I need some help, man. I need, to get, I need some help to be able to do this. It's really remarkable to another team, I mean, even that somebody else hasn't reached out to you, but what better than personal experience of what you went through, right. you know, I mean, Hopefully, this podcast, somebody will read it and hear about it. Maybe you do some good and somebody will you know, give Bill Post for a call and see what happens. Well, I, I appreciate the platform, and it's nice to see you. It's been a long time. I know we've talked a, a couple of times over the last yeah, few years. Yeah, it's remarkable. I called you. you know, I, my bad. I hadn't spoken to you in a while. Out of the blue, I called you one day. I did this <clears throat> woman from uh, Sports Illustrated yes. writing a book about anxiety and baseball. And you said yes without a heartbeat. You usually would get, no, I can't do it, or not answer, or not call me back. And I mean, it shows you how open you are. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you can help people like Well, this. I think that's the reason that I say yes, because I do, like you said, I hope somebody hears it. And it can help them out. And maybe they go and they do something to help themselves out. Or maybe somebody in an organization or something says, you know what, I know this guy might have a past or if, uh, people think he's out of his mind and all that, but I've, I've grown a lot, man. I've been through a lot and I've been humbled quite a bit. And um, I feel like I have a lot to offer because I do have a, you know, my ride was, was great, but it was also very, very difficult. So um, I'm open about it. I'm, I, why not? Why not? I got nothing to hide. I never hit anything before when I was, the, you know, the, the loud mouth young guy, why, why run and hide now? I don't feel like there's any reason And you had that thing, unfortunately, you saw one of your teammates pass away with Steve B Buckler. I can't forget. Belt, yeah, Belcher. Belcher. Well, we were out running, uh, and he, I guess he was taking some, something to help him try to lose some weight, and it was very, very hot in spring training, and we did a lot of running, and back then there wasn't a, hey, the guy's feeling a little, right. he's feeling a little down. It was all, well, he was probably just, you know, had too many drinks last night or something, just make him keep running. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we got, we saw him lose his life and that was, you know, that was rough. That was tough. That's something well, you never want to see. I tell you, but hopefully, you know, this podcast could do some good. Some of hear about it, read about it, and maybe we can, you can get people to call because you really have a big, nice story to tell, uh, Bill. Thank you. Pleasure, Jay. man. I thank you so much, man. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Bill. Thank you.